and we're like, let them out of the car. The man was like, no, I'm not letting them out of the car. I'm taking them to the county jail. They committed their crime. I'm going to go book them in jail. You can get them from there. And when I say they surrounded the car, there's like, there'll probably be a link in this video to some of the descriptions. And they had over a hundred correction officers. They had helicopters. There was boats in the rivers. They had a hundred men chasing us. So when I tell you they surrounded the car, there was a ton of them. going on YouTube welcome back to part two of this crazy interview we got going on with Brian right now also if you haven't already done so jump over to Brian's channel and subscribe on his YouTube channel go ahead and tell us what your channel is one more time Brian it's called bounce back life after prison bounce back life after prison it's got a catchy sound to it so make sure there's a link in the description of this video also in part one there's a link to the description please guys do me a favor and subscribe and show Brian all the love that you guys show me so in part two of this video, if you haven't seen part one, please, there's a link in this video to part one. Go back and watch that first or else you're going to be a little bit out of sorts. But Brian explained the process of how he was facing capital murder, spent 30 months in county jail fighting his case all the way down to where he accepted a plea of manslaughter, receiving a sentence of 10 years. Now he's over at Lake, uh, Lake Butler State Prison in Florida. And the whole time he's just thinking, when is my opportunity going to rise to where I can escape out of here? Because I don't think I should be in prison for what I did. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the actual escape. So take us through how this process actually happened uh, up into where you left off yesterday, Brian. So we're at this really like, because we had access to the internet. You know, we were seeing freedoms and uh, places. We were seeing a lot of things that, honestly, being in prison, you should not have access to in that way because it just makes you want to be that much more free. Um, so we were doing our research on the different countries that don't extradite. We find places to get um, fake IDs made, birth certificates. Um, we had access to make money from buying things out of China, reselling them on eBay. <clears throat> so with that access to the internet, it just gave us infinite freedom that, well, was kind of dangerous for an inmate to have. So then I start to build this relationship with this correction officer that it turned into a situation that I wasn't really pursuing it. And the more that I kind of pushed away from it, the more she pursued it. And then I realized, hey, wait, if this is going on, what can I get if I do start to ask? So I started kind of like digging into it and started um, befriending her more and started talking to her more and just basically started to see what I could get out of her. And, you know, there's probably going to be quite a few people that watch this and are going to say, hey, man, this is horrible. You did her wrong. And for that, yeah, I admit it, I did do her wrong. Um, but what you got to keep in mind as well is that I definitely did not twist her arm. And she pursued me at the very beginning. And I'm talking about a person who is trained from day one. Do not befriend these people. Do not. They will use you. They will manipulate you. So it wasn't a situation where I tricked her into anything or anything like that. She knew exactly what she was doing. Um, but yeah, I do feel bad about it. I did use her and it did turn all bad for both her and I. Things started to progress. We started to become more friendly. Um, I started to ask for more things. And it got to a point where it didn't matter what I asked for, she would give it to me. Um, and one situation I'll tell you guys about, um, I had not had any alcohol in years. I was never like an alcoholic, but you know, I'd like to hang out and drink a couple of drinks here and there. And so I asked her one night, would she bring some water bottles full of alcohol? And the way to do it was you take the water bottle and drill a hole in the bottom, drill, let all the water come out, refill it with vodka 
<laughs> fill it back up. I can imagine how time consuming it was too to try to fill this whole entire water bottle full of vodka, right? So you fill it back full of vodka and then put some hot glue on the bottom. Now you got a water bottle that looks like it's never been opened because the cap's still on it, right? So she did. She brought me a whole locker full. I mean, her box was full. Her lunchbox was full of water bottles, full of vodka. And uh, uh, it was just, that was a crazy situation. I ended up violently sick that night. But in all the little things that she kept bringing me, I kept seeing that there was just never a no. She would not tell me no to anything. <clears throat> and it got to a point that I felt like I could ask her, hey, look, let's jump off the edge of the world. And she would be like, yeah, okay, sure, let's do it. Um, so at some point, doing all my research on uh, the places that don't extradite, finding out about the IDs, finding out about the birth certificates, um, generating an income, um, I tell her, hey, look, I'm, I'm about to leave. I'm going to escape. And she's like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> Stop playing. I said, yeah, look, there's only a couple things that are going to happen. One, you're going to go turn me in. Two, you're going to help me escape. Or three, I'm going to escape without your help. Number one, I knew she wasn't going to go turn me in. Um, and pretty much I knew that she was going to help me escape. I felt like she was. And at that point, when she seen I was not kidding about it, that I was serious, she put her head on the desk and started crying. I'm like, why, why are you crying? She was like, you're going to get me put in prison. And so <laughs> this is bad, guys. I'm sorry I'm laughing about it because it's, it's really not funny. But when she said that, I was like, you're not going to be in prison. We're going to be in paradise. Stop crying. <laughs> so a couple of weeks later, she was in prison. Um, and how that happened was when she agreed to go along with the plan, I had her bring like a, a blue piece of cloth in her lunchbox and we taped it to the wall in the bathroom. She brought a t-shirt and a camera and took pictures of me with the blue background, like an ID background. And then we sent the pictures off, had IDs made. Um, we ordered the birth certificates, we ordered the airline tickets. And now the plan was, because I worked in the maintenance building and she was a correctional officer, it's nothing for her to be around the uh, prison grounds, even on her day off. And it's easy for her to navigate around there because they're not ever going to question her. In fact, while I was at work in the maintenance building, she would come over there and see me at times while she was off work. The plan was, <clears throat> I told her, look, go buy some um, more BDUs, which are the, the clothing, the pants that the correction officers wear. Give me a jacket with the correction officer jacket and a hat. Bring it to the maintenance building. Dump it off in the uh, recycle pile. I'm going to go out there and change into the clothing. And basically, she was going to pick me up, drive me to um, Gainesville, Gainesville, Florida. And from there, I was going to meet a friend of mine. And he was going to drive me to the airport in Atlanta, Georgia, where I would get on an airline and fly to um, San Diego. From there, make my way across the border and hopefully make it to Guatemala. <laughs> so uh, she agreed to all of that. And we pulled the trigger on it. We went ahead with it, but I didn't have a backup plan. And things immediately started to go wrong because um, when she came and dropped the clothing off, I got dressed. Um, I was actually laying down in like the scrap recycle pile. I get dressed, put the uniform on. And as I'm leaving, walking out of there, I actually walked directly past a couple of correction officers that were talking. They didn't even look at me twice. I <laughs> walked right past them wearing their uniform. Jump in the truck, we leave. And um, I called a friend of mine that was supposed to be giving me a ride to the airport in Atlanta. And he says, I can't come and get you. My kid is in the hospital. You're going to have to go with my little brother. And I'm like, I don't even know your little brother. And immediately she's like, whoa, you don't know him. Don't go with him. But... I'm like, no, nah, you just, the plan was for her, she had to go to a doctor's appointment that morning in uh, Gainesville. So it was going to look like the only thing she did was get up and go to the doctor. So the, I was like, no, stick to the plan. You go to the doctor. I'll go with this guy. I'll, I'll make do with him. So when I go with this guy, the little brother, um, we're, we're driving down the road and the guy starts panicking. He's like, man, I don't want to get in trouble. I hope I don't get caught. There's but another guy. There's another guy with you at this point, right? It's, there's, yeah, there is a co-defendant with me, another guy who escaped with me. So it was myself, my co-defendant, 
And then the female correction officer helped us escape. And then when we met up with my friend's brother, my co-defendant was with me. We were both wearing the correction officer uniform. Okay. So we were riding with this guy, this brother who I don't know. And we were headed way out somewhere in the country. I don't, I don't know exactly where it was at, but it was far out in the country of Florida. And, um, when we get out to where we're going, I remember we crossed over like a uh, bridge and I seen the sun coming up on the left-hand side. Like I looked out the window and seen the sun coming up. So that just, that stayed in my mind crossing that river with the sun on the left. And we get to this farm where this kid was working at this guy, young guy. Um, we get to the farm and on the way to that farm, we went down probably five miles of dirt road. Literally, no houses, just all farmland. There's nobody out here. Um, and when we get to this farm, this kid, when I say kid, he's just a young guy. This kid, he calls the cops and, and tells them that we're out here at this farm, that the guys who escaped, they were out here. And um, during this time, we were waiting on the actual original brother who was supposed to give me a ride. We were waiting on him to come and get us, right? but we're sitting way in the back of the farm and I see a cop car coming and I tell my buddy who was with me, I'm like, Hey, there's the cops. He was like, ah, no big deal. And then I seen an uh, unmarked cop car and a canine truck coming and the canine truck. I knew exact. Those were the canine officers from the compound where I just left from. I'm like, Hey, that's canine. They're here for us. We got to go. So we take off, we're running through the woods and, um, we run for approximately about an hour and a half through the woods. We're climbing over stuff, crawling under things. But during this time of running, I, I'm thinking to myself, keep the sun on my left, uh, right hand side, because if I keep it on the right, I'll eventually get back to the river that I seen a little while ago while I was riding in the truck. And um, during that hour and a half of time, I probably ran three times as much as my buddy because I would be so far ahead and I would look back and not see him. I'd be like, where is this guy at? I keep having to run back and tell him, hey, man, come on, come on, speed it up, let's go. If they catch us out here in the woods, we're dead, we're done, we're toast. And I don't want to leave them. And if I would have left him and they caught him alone in the woods and they killed him, I'm going to be charged with it. So I'm definitely like, <laughs> I have some incentive to make sure, let's go, man, move it. Come on, keep up. Um, so by the time we get to the river, I had done probably ran three times as much as him. But we make it to this river and this was around Thanksgiving uh, 2007. So it was cold outside. But you had a couple things that came into play. It was cold outside. I'd been running for about an hour and a half and not just running, but feeling like I'm running for my life because we had these correction officers chasing us that are definitely going to kill us if they catch us out here in the woods. So my adrenaline's pumping. My body temperature is elevated just from all the running, but it's cold outside. And now we're at this river that is a spring fed river that is freezing cold. Not like freezing, like ice 30 something degrees cold, but it, when you jump in, you're like, oh, this water's freezing. And we jump in the water, right? And that's what it was, freezing. Oh, God, it was, it was brutal. And we're gonna try to swim our way across this water to the other side of the river. And as I get probably about halfway into the river, it just feels like my, all of my limbs, my arms, my legs, everything's just filled with concrete. I guess it was like the lactic acid building up from all the exertion. And I just felt like I could not swim anymore. I felt like, no, I was just done. But now I'm in the middle of the river. I'm looking like, oh, where do I go? <laughs> so the only place that I know is I actually, I kick my shoes off thinking that the shoes were weighing me down. When I kicked my shoes off, my feet went straight down. So now I'm like, oh, I lost, lost <laughs> my little bit of life preserver uh, by kicking my shoes off. And now I'm just struggling. I, I mean, I'm panicking, I'm scared. I'm, uh, this was a difficult time. And for a brief second, I was just like, you know what? Screw it, I'm just gonna drown. And I started going to the water and I'm choking things are turning black. It's probably like a millisecond that all of this is happening. But I'm thinking to myself, if I drown right now, my kid is not going to have a father. And that was really the only thought that I had. And it just felt like immediately something just grabbed me and, and pulled me out of the water because 
honestly, I still to this day don't know how I made it to the other side of the river. Um, nevertheless, I did. And once we get to the other side of the river, I, I looked around and there was like a tree that had broken. The banks were real high above the water. There was a tree that had broken up top and it fell into the water. So it was like this part was on the bank and then this part was in the water. It's like, all right, we got to climb up this tree, shimmy our way up the tree because that way our feet print aren't seen on the bank anywhere. So we head up the tree and we get to the very top. Um, now I'm barefooted. I'm tired, I'm dehydrated, um, I'm just worn out. As I stand up at the top of this tree limb, I hit my head right on a, like a broken splintered branch, and now I'm just leaking blood. Um, the head wound's pretty, pretty vicious, you know, they bleed easily, especially when your adrenaline is pumping, your heart's beating fast. Um, so now I'm just pouring blood, I'm barefooted. All right, listen, I got tender feet too. <laughs> I got tender city feet. I, my mom always made me wear my shoes. So I'm not used to running barefooted. Now I'm in the middle of this forest, barefooted, leaking blood, dehydrated, tired, and running for my life. Bad combination without a backup plan. <laughs> so here I am running and running and running and my leg starts to Charlie horse, one of my legs, the hamstring. So the back of my leg, just, like my leg bends like this. And I'd fall down and my buddy had to bend my leg out. We'd take off running again. And then from there, it started both legs bending at the same time, both legs Charlie horsing. That's brutal. That's difficult. And luckily, it was with me. Otherwise, I'd have just been laying there on the ground, hog tied without any ties. <laughs> I'd have just been there perfectly for them to come and get me. But he would bend my legs back out. And it got to the point that the only way for me to run was run straight legged. I couldn't bend my knees because bending my knees would immediately make my legs charge the horse. In fact, in our running, somehow we ended up back in the river a couple of times because it's like a, a windy, snaky river. And I was trying to drink water out of the river to hydrate myself, but nothing was working. Um, and so we ran for probably about 10 hours. Um, we ended up catching a ride with someone. We paid the kid some money. Um, the kid took me to his house to got me a pair of flip flops, uh, like, sandals and um when he did he went aside he dropped his girl off and his dad came outside and was like hey man i know who you guys are it's been all over the police scanner the man was a uh, volunteer fireman so at that point i'm like look but we already gave you kids some money we don't want any problems keep the money we'll we'll keep it moving and the man said no don't worry about it i'm gonna let him give you guys a ride and he did this man turned me and my co-defendant free with this, with his son, and say, yeah, go ahead, give him a ride. Um, knowing me, you know, the kid was not in any harm from me, but I mean, he was not in any risk of me harming him. But this man didn't know me, and he knows that this man, that I escaped from prison. I'm charged with manslaughter. I can't believe that. Still to this day, I'm like, why did he turn his kid loose with me and another man who just escaped from prison? So what he did though is when we left. He called the police and gave them the tag number, and they issued a uh, bolo be on the lookout for that car. And as we're driving, it's late. Um, like I said, I'm tired. I'm worn out. I lost a lot of blood. I, I'm dehydrated. It's just all bad. And I'm in the back seat of a two door Honda Civic, crunched up. Uh, man, it's horrible. So we passed by a state trooper, and the cop did a U turn. And the kid's like, hey, man, the cop just turned around. And I was like, you know what? If he turns the lights on, just pull over, man. I'm tired. Right. I'm beat. <laughs> so cop turns his lights on, pulls us over, gets us out of the car, and immediately my leg charlie horses, and I fall out, boom. So they dive on me. They think I was trying to pull something. I'm like, no, my legs are charlie horse, and I'm, I'm dehydrated. So they didn't really do anything, any damage to us. They cuff us up and throw us in the cop car and uh, – a couple minutes later, DOC pulls up and they're screaming, let them out of the car, let them out of the car. But the, the state trooper was like, no, nah, I'm not going to let them out of the car. And the reason he didn't was because my co-defendant, during the time we were sitting in the back car, was making small talk with the cop and letting him know, look, man, don't turn us over to DOC. If you do turn us over, we're not going to make it back alive. So in his talkings, even though I was against it, I was like, dude, stop talking to this man. He's taking us back to jail. <laughs> so 
Luckily he was because luckily he did talk to him because when the DOC came, Department of Corrections, the prison correctional officers came and were like, let them out of the car. The man was like, no, I'm not letting them out of the car. I'm taking them to the county jail. They committed the crime. I'm going to go book them in jail. You can get them from there. And when I say they surrounded the car, there's like, there'll probably be a link in this video to some of the descriptions. And they had over a hundred correction officers. They had helicopters. There was boats in the rivers. They had a hundred men chasing us. So when I tell you they surrounded the car, there was a ton of them. And that in the link, you'll see that. You'll see some of the description about that where DOC is talking about how they had over a hundred people chasing us. So they were quite upset. And um, luckily that, that state trooper was like, no, nah, I'm not going to turn them over to you. And he took us to a Lashville County Jail and booked us on that charge. So he booked us on escape from prison. <laughs> so now we're sitting in a Lashville County Jail with an escape charge. We only sat there for one day. <clears throat> we went to court the very next morning. And at that point, uh, DOC was there. They came with like video cameras, camcorders, <clears throat> and a big squad of people, all of them, a bunch of guns. And they were like, you guys aren't going to get away now. Luckily, though, you know, they came with the cameras and uh, which was kind of like beneficial to us because they weren't trying to like beat us or kill us on camera. Um, and from there, they took us directly to FSP. It's something I forgot to ask you earlier, which I already know the answer to, but I, I want you to tell the viewers. <clears throat> when you guys initiated this plan, how much time did you think you guys would be looking at if you were to get caught with this escape charge? Well, <sighs> You know, I was kind of, I took, I knew that I was facing up to 15 extra years for an escape. In our research, we did research on the uh, people that successfully escape, and it was pretty much like nobody is successfully s escaping and staying gone. But I do know in Florida for escaping, you could potentially get up to 15 years. And then multiple things come into play as far as how much time you would get there, um, depending on how bad your record is depending on whether or not someone was hurt. Um, there's just so many factors that could come into play there. Um, in our particular case, we all, three of us got charged. That was me, my co-defendant, and the correctional officer. Um, she pretty much just told them, because they already suspected her, her and I of having a relationship. So she was one of the first persons that they came to. Um, so they ended up char charging her with escape. Um, they charged all three of us with escape. They gave her two counts of escape, one for helping me and one for helping him. And in this town, like she knew everybody in this little town. She knew the prosecutor and she told the prosecutor, she was like, look, whatever you're going to give him, give it all to me. Don't give him any extra time. I'm going to do it all. But obviously they couldn't do it that way. So he told her, look, I'll give you a year right now. Take this deal because DOC wants me to give you a bunch more time. And then he gave my co-defendant a year, and then he told me he'd give me a year and a half. So she got a year, he got a year, and then I got a year and a half added on to my sentence. You were expecting probably to get a little bit more than that, I would imagine. So that was, when they told you a year, year and a half, that you were, you were like, okay. I <laughs> took that with a, a slight sigh of relief. I was like, whew, all right, this is over with. <laughs> So you get thrown back into prison. They don't bring you back to uh, <clears throat> North Florida correct, uh, Reception Center over Butler. They no. bring you somewhere else now. And you kind of bounce around a few different places. Uh, we are going to have another video with Brian, guys, in the future where it's going to talk more about the prison experience separate from like what a lot of the federal nonviolent offenders go through. Because I know a lot of you are having questions right now. What was his prison experience like? But we are going to talk about that in a separate video if Brian's cool with that. Um, but Absolutely. today. I want to really focus on, you know, so I went back into the prison system. How many years did you have left roughly at this point after, after you were caught? So after I was caught, they added the year and a half on. I was caught same day. So that was 2007. So once they added more time on and took my gain time away, which is the time I accumulated for staying out of trouble and working, once they added everything onto it, I now had seven more years until I would EOS end of sentence. So seven more years to go. And if you hadn't escaped, how much time did you have left at the time of that same day, basically? I, from how many years? I would have gotten out uh, January of 2012. 
my end result was I got out July to, uh, 2014. So almost three years, two and a half years. Two and a half years, two years yeah. So you added two and a half years onto your sentence. I imagine, was there a psychological effect from that? Or did you feel like it was worth it? I went for it. Do you wish you hadn't done it at that point? Was there reason? Um, you know, a lot of things crossed my mind, but what happened was whenever they picked me up from Alachua County Jail, they took me to a place called the FSP, Florida State Prison. 100% lockdown, solitary confinement. They send worst cases to this prison. That's from people that are complete psych cases. They have to take a lot of psych meds every day that are extremely violent. Um, they can't be on the compound without attacking people, without attacking the police. Um, then you have guys that are actually my neighbor, Dwight England. Um, he was in prison on a life sentence and he devised an escape plan as well. His was quite a bit, well, his was more violent, definitely 100% more violent because there was no violence in mine. Their plan was to tie up the lady that they worked for, the correctional officer, then get some ladders from the department that they worked in, tie the ladders up, put them over the fence and make their way to freedom, right? However, one of the guys hit the lady with a hammer that they were just gonna tie up. And when he hit her with the hammer, he killed her. And so at that point, everything just went totally screwed up. Um, for whatever reason, they took the lady and tied her upside down in a mop closet by her feet and just let all the blood drain down the drain. So now they tie, killed a correction officer, tied her upside down in the mop closet, took the ladders, uh, tied the ladders together, put them in the fence and tried to make their way over the fence. And the, the ladder broke and they got caught up in the barbed wire, the razor wire of the fence. So that guy was my neighbor when I first got to FSP. And when you say neighbor, you're talking about in the cell next to you, not. Yeah. Okay. So FSP is all one man cell. There's no two man cells. And when you speak of a neighbor, that's going to be, you have a cell on this side and you have one on this side. Um, I never really got to see him because you're locked in there 24 hours a day, you know? So you hear people talk about 23 and one, you know, you're locked in the cell 23 hours You come out for an hour a day. FSP does not see that. They don't give two dams about the rules. They're not going to give you that hour a day. You're like, you might get an hour a week. And if you piss them off, you might not get an hour ever. Um, they don't care about the rules. They, they have their own rules back there. And anybody thinking that, you know, you're going to go to FSP, and get treated treated humanely <laughs> you're thinking the wrong way because they're not treating people humanely i mean granted people did things to be in prison but fsp is its own world a hundred percent and that's where they sent me when i escaped so um a lot of things went through my mind after that um a lot of things a lot of emotions a lot of thoughts um but when they locked me inside the cell with two doors and no window that was the biggest turning point in my life, in my thinking. Um, I began to really analyze my decisions and my thought process and what was important to me. And now I, for the first time in my life, been sitting in a place that, you know, being in jail, being in prison was, it was no, there wasn't a single day that it was enjoyable. Um, but now sitting in this type of confinement, took away all the different things that, you know, you might be occupied with when you're on the compound, like uh, going to chow or going to the rec field or just anything, going to work. Now you're locked in a cell 24 hours a day with nothing but you and your thoughts. And it's- How long, it's how long were you there for? 30 months, 30 months in solitary confinement. And two things happen. It's either gonna make you or it's gonna break you. Two things, there's no in between. And when I say break you, there was literally multiple cases that I knew of personally while I was there. For instance, um, when people leave their cell, you can hear the chains rattling because anytime you, you step foot out of a cell, you're gonna be hand, handcuffed and shackled. And you can hear, guys can hear that, the echo of their, the chains rattling. Um, and one day I remember hearing the chains coming down the hallway and um, I hear a guy say, hey Sarge, the dude's hanging in the cell and you hear like the commotion of everybody stopped and you hear the Sarge. He said, yeah, he sure is. Ain't he? 
then you hear the commotion start again. They left the man hanging there. They didn't even attempt to go in there and get him. They left the man hanging there while they went and took the guy that they were escorting down to his cell, put him in a cell, unshackled him, unhandcuffed him. Then they went back only to get the man, <laughs> however many minutes later it was. It was definitely minutes. The man was dead. I mean, I, I don't know that they could have saved him to begin with. But what I'm telling you, that place is a different world like, like no other. So what else went off in your head there where it sounds like you said that was the turning point where you, you found some, uh, some inner strength. How do you see that as a wake-up call going through that 30 months of solitary confinement? Well, <clears throat> you know, I, I lost all type of visitation. I was not allowed to have, they, they suspended my visitation indefinitely. So my only form of communication during that time was writing people. And a lot of people would not even write back to me. So, my what really changed for me was when I, I communicated with my daughter and I remember her telling me she told me this in person but I remember her telling me on paper as well that what were you thinking if you would have gotten away I would have never talked to you again <laughs> I'm just like oh man what was I thinking because apparently I was only thinking of myself you know I had this grand illusion and plan that I could make it to this other country and be free and be able to see my child and and, but when she told me that, she was like, I, I would not even talk to you anymore. You know, that was just like, and it was extremely heartbreaking. And then another big thing for me while sitting in this place was, um, like I said, it was a make or break situation. And what I learned, I started uh, studying this program called Siddha Yoga. And what I was learning from that is that no matter what you're going through, no matter what the environment is, no matter what is going on around you, no matter what somebody says to you, no matter if the police come to your cell and threaten you or they come in your cell and tear your cell to pieces, no matter if they come in and put their hands on you, which is something that they were doing on the daily. They, they never came in their, my cell and put their hands on me, um, but they were doing it frequently and I've seen them do it frequently. And the, you're in a no-win uh, situation when that happens. Um, but what I learned sitting there and came to understand and came to use it on a daily basis and it was a practice that you have to exercise is that outside situation, circumstances or words or actions from other people don't mean a thing. The only thing that matters is how you react, how you respond, what you think about it. So basically somebody could come up and, and spit on you, which most people would think that a normal reaction would be hey, why'd you spit on me or to retaliate against this person, right? But it's all about the choice that you make in that instance. So it's not the person saying something or spitting on you that makes you react away. What I began to realize and understand is that it's how you respond, it's how you react, it's how you think about it. And everybody has the power to respond and think about any situation the way that they choose to. And when I started realizing that, and started implementing that into my life and started practicing that. I was in a situation where dudes were killing themselves and it, it, it just, it, I didn't allow it to bother me. I didn't allow that situation to control me. And that was really a power, powerful turning point in my thinking and in my life. How long were you in solitary before you started to take on this new thought process and forming new habits? So, the neighbor that I told you about that was on death row, Dwight, England, it was probably about a week, maybe two weeks. I'm not sure the exact time frame. It was not a long time. Um, he told me to shoot my line out in the hallway. Shoot your line means um, you make a fishing line, whether it's out of uh, the thread out of your box or elastic or out of your sheet. Basically, you take a bunch of thin strings, braid them together, and you can make a rope out of it. And on that rope, you uh, put what is called a car. So maybe you take your toothpaste or a bar of soap, tie it to the end of the string. On there, you put some uh, like paper, clip, paper clips um, with like bent, with like hooks in them, and you sling it out of the, from under the crack of your door. When it goes out, the other guy shoots his, uh, his fishing line, so they cross each other, and those paper clips make them hook. And so I shot my line out. He shot his out, caught it. He pulls it in his cell, pulls my line over to his cell. He ties on some paperwork and says, hey, pull your line. I pulled it back to me and attached 
to the line was that Siddha Yoga program. He's like, take that and read it. He's like, if you like it, all you have to do is write them. They'll send you a, a course for the month. And then each additional month, you write them and say, continue the course. And they'll, they'll send it to you for like 12 years. So it's a 12-year course that they send you a course per month. Um, and so that it was probably only a couple of weeks that I was sitting there that I started to get my courses sent in. Um, and that, that's actually a program that people on the streets can get, but you have to pay for it. If you are incarcerated, they'll send it to you for free. Or at that time, they were sending it to people that were incarcerated for free. What, what's, what's the program called again? Siddic Yoga? No, Siddha. It's spelled S-I-D-D-H-A. I believe that's the spelling, but it's Siddha. Siddha. Siddha Yoga. We're actually going to put a link to that in the description of this video because that sounds extremely interesting. What's really fascinating about this is this guy is on death row. This was the guy that hit the female correction officer in the head, hung her upside down, bled her out into a drain, and then tried to escape. He's sitting on death row in the cell next to you. You can't see him. You're yelling through, I imagine, pipes or vents, right? Exactly. So that's how you're communicating. He knows that you're in a rough spot. He knows he's going to die, yet you get some last moment wisdom from somebody as they're, you know, preparing for death. So I have to imagine he had found some kind of peace with, with his life to even be able to refer you to do that. that that's, that's kind of a, that's a giant mental fuckery that anybody watching this right now, I don't know if they can imagine being on death row, finding peace. Uh, and it sounds like that's what this guy in the cell next to you did. Yeah, for sure. You know, I would hear him talking, um, they would do like a weekly round where like the warden and some of the higher ups, like a white shirt, we call them a white shirt that might be a major a, a colonel um, classification. They would bring it like a team of four or five, six people around um, and do like supposedly checking on people. But really, they're just coming to pick, 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 pick things apart. <laughs> pick, pick, pick. They're coming to just pick things apart. Why isn't your bed made properly? Why is it this? Why is it this? And they would always go to his cell and antagonize this guy. Obviously, they weren't happy this man killed the female correction officer. Right. And they would just pick at this man. And granted, I could not see in his cell, but from the communication that him and I had, um, I'm pretty sure that they were just continually poking and trying to antagonize him. I mean, they, he would tell me they would come to his, tra his door with his food tray and pick the lid up and spit in it and hand him his food tray right in his face. Um, he, they would come to his door with the tray, a food tray, because they had cameras in the hallway. They couldn't see in the cell, but they would see a ca uh, on camera, in case this was ever debated, a food tray going into his cell. But when they pulled the lid off of it and handed it to him, it'd be an empty tray. So they were, not, they were starving him. They were spitting in his food. Um, I mean, you know, I'm not condoning anything he did, you know, killing a, a female correction officer, obviously not a good thing. No, but I think, I think the message you're, you're, you're saying here is a good one. He fucked up bad. There's no taking back what he did, but what exactly. you stated earlier is you ultimately have a choice as to how you react. And he created his consequences. He put himself into the situation, but how did he react when they spit in his food? It sounds like he's on a different path now. That's exactly where it was at. So no matter what they were doing to him, and he had already been in there for a while before I came, um, and he had already been studying this program. And no matter what they were doing to him, they couldn't get a rise out of him. They could not get him to uh, react the way that they wanted him to react. Um, is he still on death row, or is he? Last I checked, yeah, he was still on death row. Um, Have you written him a letter? Huh? Have you thought about writing him a letter? Um, to be honest with you, I have not. No, he, I haven't. I probably should. I, you know, now that you mention it, um, I probably will write him a letter. I, I haven't, um, just due to the fact that since being home four years, I've been nonstop. You know, when you come home after 11 years of being in prison, that's over a decade. That's one fourth of my life was broken into four pieces. That's one fourth of it's been in prison. Um, and you have to start over. And the world has moved on. Everything has progressed. Technology has progressed. The world has changed. And here I am starting over at a late age, trying to catch up with the world. So it's just been, I've been nonstop. And honestly, no, I haven't, I have not written them. I'm still in communication with some guys in prison. 
um, but not by writing. Some of the guys that I know have cell phones, so I do still communicate with some of them. Well, it, it sounds like that's, even though there was some more prison experience after that, that, that sounds like that was your pivotal turning point to like, I don't want to live like this anymore. I think there's a lot to do with where you are now in your life. So for those of you that are watching right now, uh, stay tuned for tomorrow as we do the final episode here, part three, with Brian and his life after prison, start talking about his YouTube channel, some other businesses that he's created. Uh, he's not living in a shithole. He's not driving around in a piece of shit car. He's got a family. He's got a beautiful home now. He's only been out of prison since 2014. And he's going to tell us how he achieved this. But before we end this video, I want to leave you with a, uh, with, a, with a task, Brian. I think you should reach out to this guy because it, he left you with a, a gem of information that seems like if it wasn't for that, you may not have made it through 30 months of of mental proper attitude. You could have gone a very different dark direction, even possibly crazy in a solitary confinement type of a situation. So think about writing them. Um, 100%, yeah. I, right, yeah, guys. you know, I'm, I'm gonna let you hold me accountable to that. I, I'm definitely gonna write him, I'm gonna look him up. Um, I, I know his name, so I'll definitely do that. And you're absolutely right, because it was breaking people on a daily basis. Um, one instance, I won't go into it because there's a lot, a lot of detail to it. A guy came to that exact wing that I was on. I, he asked the officer, hey, when did we get to come out of the cell? He was like, you're not coming out of the cell. Well, when do I get to watch TV? You're not watching TV. He's like, well, what? How long am I gonna be back here? He had killed his roommate. So they put him on this wing as a punishment. They're like, you're gonna be back here for a while, bud. The man took a, made a rope like the fishing line I was talking about and took a little small short pencil, like a security pencil that they give you, put the rope around his neck and started twisting the pencil. Mm. He was a big heavyweight, over, uh, overweight guy. Started twisting the pencil around and around and around until it tightened up around his neck and basically killed himself from as, asphyxiation. Choked himself to death. Just, he couldn't take it. And he was only back there a couple of days. Yeah, 